and another type of mutation causes low blood sugars and high insulin. And so um, that, that's been like the most recent and very exciting uh, things that we've learned. And indeed, in the last year, there's basically been another two genes found. Uh, and a lot of this work has been done in uh, England by Andrew Hattersley and his group, sorry, Khalid Hussain in London. And they've, they've been doing some tremendous work on the single gene diabetes. Um, we've also found conditions where exercise induces low blood sugars. And uh, Timo Tonkonski in uh, Finland discovered uh, defects in the pathway of lactate and pyruvate that cause exercise induced uh, low blood sugar. So, you know, when you go out and you run hard and your body is deficient in oxygen, you build up lactate levels. Well, in the normal person, that lactate, uh, uh, when you start, when you recover and you breathe and get your oxygen back, the lactate levels go down. But in, in patients with a specific defect in a transporter, that elevated lactate triggers insulin release. So for all of the babies who have K2P channel defects, exercising is not going to make them have a low blood sugar. So don't be worrying about that. This is a very specific rare form of hyperinsulinism. So it's been a very exciting time for those of us in the field. So um, the, la the last thing I want to get to is where we've, what we've done in terms of focal and diffuse surgery in the last um, three to five years. So I told you that we were doing this venous sampling. It's called uh, transhepatic portal venous sampling. It was done in Paris and in Philadelphia. We were doing arterial stimulation. We called it uh, uh, ASVS, arterial stimulation with venous sampling. Uh, and those techniques were pretty good. We found about 70% of the focal lesions, but they were dangerous and had serious side effects. And in the early 2000s, a group in Paris and in Finland worked together and uh, PET scanning had been in, in discovered. And a PET scanner is a type of scan that looks at function of cells. And if cells are functioning faster or higher, then they light up more than if they're not. And so they discovered that if they injected 18 fluoridopa into the babies with hyperinsulinism and scanned their pancreas, that those who had diffuse disease had even uptake throughout the whole pancreas, but those who had focal disease had a little bright spot in the pancreas indicating the focal area with a little bit of uptake uh, everywhere else. And so this was a really a wonderful advancement because the baby can have a, some sedation or general anesthesia, be popped into the PET scanner, <coughs> have an injection of 18 fluoridopa, it lights up the focal lesion, and they usually do either a CT or an MRI at the same time so that they can match up with x-rays and uh, the picture of the, the bright versus uh, less bright areas, match them up together and get a structural picture so they can see what part of the pancreas this is in. So they overlay the two pictures and you can see where the pancreas, the focal lesion is. And of course, this makes it far easier now for the surgeons. So uh, this has been wonderful and uh, Philadelphia, uh, started to do, look at this technique in about 2003, 2004, after it had been discovered by the French and uh, Finnish people. And they uh, did a study, and over the course of about four to five years, they scanned about 100 kids and found that they were able to identify correctly uh, around 85 to 90 percent of the children. So we did a great job in improving the sensitivity of the studies with a massive increase in safety and decrease in risk. So the problem you're saying is, that's wonderful, Dr. Thornton, so why isn't everyone having a PET scan these days? Well, the problem is that in the United States, 18-fluoridopa uh, is an experimental drug. It is not allowed to be used by uh, any, just anyone. It has to be done under a research protocol. So those of you who may have been in Philadelphia probably remember signing pages and pages of consent forms. Um, and so it's very difficult to, to get. The second problem with 18 fluoridopa is it's very difficult to make, it's very expensive to make, and you have to make it right beside your PET scanner. So you can't say, uh, I'd like to order some 18 fluoridopa and send in an order to some company and they ship it down to you and then you sit there for three or four days and you schedule your PET scanner. It has to be made and injected within two to six hours probably maybe not even six hours, maybe four hours. So you have to be able to make it on site. And of course, because there's one in 50,000 children in the country have got hyperinsulinism, um, and there's three million births a year, you can work out the numbers. 
there's only about 100 babies a year in this country will have hyperinsulinism and a certain percentage of them respond to diazoxide and, and so there's probably only about 50 to 75 babies a year in the country who need a PET scan. So for someone to set up the process to do this is very expensive. Um, so currently the only place in the United States that uh, has FDA approval to do PET scans is in the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. So that gets me down to what are we doing in Cook Children's. Well, as you know, I worked in Philadelphia and uh, uh, all, most of the research that I've done in my lifetime has been related to hyperinsulinism. And so when I came to Texas back in 2003, I thought it would be really nice to see if we could do something uh, in Texas for our babies with hyperinsulinism. But I, I came into a department that had a lot of things that needed to be done and it really took me uh, three or four years to be able to start to focus on my own research career and, and getting the things that I wanted to do back in order again. And so we wrote some proposals to my institution, Cook Children's Medical Center, and last year they funded a formal hyperinsulinism program. We have our hyperinsulinism nurse, Lisa, who's here. We have our own uh, surgical team who's now becoming quite experienced in doing uh, pancreatic surgeries. We have our own radiologists, gastroenterologists, and neonatologists, and so we've put together a multidisciplinary team. We have our own social worker, nutritionist, and psychologist all on our team. So we have our whole team around. We've started to get some uh, protocols approved through our institutional research board, and so we're starting to collect data on some of our families. And most importantly is that we have found a source of 18 fluoridopa, and we have a PET scanner in our institution, and we are now uh, submitting studies to our institutional review board uh, to get permission to start doing 18 fluoridopa PET scans. And so we are probably three quarters of the way through the process in doing this, and we're anticipating now by uh, 2012 that we'll have our PET scanner up and running. Um, throughout the rest of the world, uh, Khalid Hussain has a wonderful group in London, and they uh, recently got their PET scanner up and running. Prior to that, they were sending their patients over to Berlin. Obviously, in Berlin, there's a scanner going. Uh, in Paris, they've got PET scanning, and in Finland, they've got PET scanning. And so, there are also uh, other places throughout the world where they don't have formalized hyperinsulinism centers, but they have adult centers doing research on other conditions. So, for example, this uh, agent, 18 fluoridopa, in some places is used to do research into Alzheimer's disease. So, there are other places around the world where people can get PET scans. So really in the last five years, the, 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 the ability to diagnose focal from diffuse has changed from those invasive studies into the PET scanner. And now the real challenge in the US is to get 18 fluoridopa approved uh, for general use and to take teams like they have in Philadelphia and teams that we now have in CHOP or in uh, Cook Children's Medical Center. And uh, probably we need another team out in the West Coast and really with, the, with three teams throughout the country, we could probably handle uh, most of the babies that need surgery. And so one of the issues we have to address is uh, convincing insurers that this is really important. And you know, for those of you who have diffuse disease, I'm sure you've already seen the horrible cost, both in terms of financially, and, and, and I'm sure you've seen the bills that have come from the hospitals, and the horrible cost in terms of personal on your family lives and how difficult it is to look after these kids. And then you talk to a family who have a focal child who's cured, and that's so different story. You know, three months after the baby is born, they've been through the process of diagnosis and uh, management, failed medical management, PET scanning and surgery, and if you're cured, life is just unbelievably different than if you have diffuse disease. And so it's really important that we develop these centers around the country and in different countries, like in London. And in London, the government over there has uh, dedicated, I, I think they either have one or two uh, major centers, uh, because this disease is so rare that you really need to see a lot of kids to get good at managing them. You'll notice, for example, when you go from your neonatologist to your primary endocrinologist, a big leap in knowledge about hyperinsulinism, and then when you go from your primary endocrinologist to a specialized center like ours, or Philadelphia, that there's this huge leap again in knowledge and experience. And so this disease is so rare 
and so dangerous and so difficult to manage that it's really a disease that needs comprehensive care centers and uh, certainly in the US we could do it uh, certainly three if not four a couple in Canada and major countries like the, uh, France and uh, and the UK currently all have one major centre and all those patients in the country go there. And so one of the things as a, as a centre that we would like is for the awareness to be out there that there are areas of excellence. And you know, one thought that we've had is that if family support group like yours and the other family support groups that are out there come across families that you can say, you know what, your doctors are probably very good but there are teams that are dedicated to looking after children with your condition and that's all that they do and, and for those of you who've been to those sort of teams you'll see there really is a difference between that and working with your local endocrinologists and most local endocrinologists know about hyperinsulinism and they've seen a couple of kids and they treat them and uh, a lot of them work with us so we're forever talking with uh, the endocrinologists around the country and helping them manage and many children don't need to come see a specialized center children who are on dioxide and doing very well and whose blood sugars are controlled and they don't need feeding tubes they can well be managed by the local endocrinologists it's the ones who are much more difficult to control that you tend to need that multidisciplinary team approach so uh, with that I'll end for now, and if any of you guys have any questions about research or what we're doing, um, I'd be happy to take questions. And if you guys on the internet want to type in a question, I'll field them as well. Yes. Yeah.